Arpana ji, over to you. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Well, on behalf of Torrent Pharma, I welcome you all for an interesting webinar uh, on pediatric tympanoplasty. Today, we are joined by six experts from India and Nepal who are sharing their knowledge on different aspects of pediatric tympanoplasty. Today, we are privileged to have our moderator, Dr. Jay Prakash Reddy, sir, uh, who has agreed to moderate uh, this session. Uh, to give you a brief about Dr. Jay Prakash Reddy, he is associated with Sri Satya Sai ENT Hospital, Karnool, as a consultant. He has conducted 27 temporal bone dissection and live ENT surgery workshop. He holds a fellowship in autology with Dr. Andres Sultan from Portman Institute, Body Paris, and Grupo Autologica Piazenza, and been awarded 17 gold medals for various assignments in this field. He is considered one of the leading experts in this field. And I thank, on behalf of Torrent Pharma, to Dr. Jay Prakash Reddy for accepting our request to be moderator for this session and welcome him for this webinar. Without much ado, I hand over the session to Dr. Jay Prakash Reddy. Over to you, sir. Yeah, good evening, everyone, and thank you for your uh, nice introduction. Uh, the idea of uh, taking up this uh, topic of pediatric tympanoplasty is that there is a lot of controversy among uh, a practicing ENT surgeons as to whether op to operate or not to operate children with uh, uh, CSYM. So there are issues if you operate early and there are some advantages and disadvantages of operating the child early. So everybody have got a lot of doubts and there are five panelists today among this, the galaxy of panelists who are experts in the field of uh, uh, ear surgery. So I'm sure that this is going to enlighten you with some uh, clear cut ideas in managing the children with the uh, so see, this uh, panel discussion is restricted only to tubotympanic disease. We will not be discussing anything about the cholesteatoma at all. So now we have five panelists today. Uh, uh, the first panelist will be Dr. Govindraj Ramaya. He is a practicing uh, ENT surgeon at Bangalore, having uh, 15 years of experience. Uh, that too has worked under the doyen of otology of our India, Dr. Mahadevaya, for 15 full years wherein he has learned the art of uh, doing um, many, many year surgeries uh, with uh, very good results. And uh, uh, moreover, he has performed more than 7,000 uh, micro ear surgeries to date. And he's also done a lot of cochlear implantations in Bangalore. So uh, thank you. I thank Dr. Govindras for accepting the invitation to join with us. And we have uh, another uh, uh, panelist, Dr. Monish Grover from Jaipur. We all know that he has been very busy these days with the webinars and he's been fantastic in discussion of many, many subjects like, and he was felicitated by Honorable Chief Minister for his work on deafness and cochlear implants. And he has got more than 70 publications for his credit and is presently working as a professor at uh, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. And I welcome Dr. Monish Grover for accepting the invitation. And we have uh, Dr. Yogesh Nipane, from uh, the Tribune University, Kathmandu, who has done uh, a fellowship in sleep medicine, sleep apnea, uh, and uh, is a very good uh, uh, micro ear surgeon too. He has a lot of inclination towards uh, micro ear surgery uh, by doing endoscopic uh, uh, way of doing things, and is very popular in uh, Nepal uh, as a ENT surgeon. I welcome Dr. Yogesh to this webinar. And we have uh, Dr. Madhuri Mehta, uh, who is uh, presently working as a director and head of ENT department at Hisar. And uh, she has successfully performed more than 40,000 major ENT surgeries. We all know Dr. Madhuri Mehata has put in a lot of efforts to bring out three books. Uh, I think maybe I know three, maybe more than that on osculoplasty and cavityless surgery. I know even though it is not written on the slide, I read her books. And our ideas uh, of in osculoplasty are really uh, very good, commendable. And we have learned a lot of things by reading those books. And I welcome Dr. Madhuri Mehta to this uh, panel discussion. And we have uh, Tushar Kanti Ghosh. He is uh, presently working uh, as a uh, consultant at his own hospital in uh, uh, 
Kolkata, and uh, he was uh, awarded as uh, Bharat Ratna Rajiv Gandhi gold medal. And this gold medal, I, I can uh, tell you that uh, I have seen Dr. T. K. Sh, uh, Ghosh Hospital, and he is a workaholic. I can tell you, he is very tremendously energetic man, and is very cheerful even in stressful situations. I have seen, and the way he is operating like a marathon in his place, and he is doing fantastic work. I witnessed his work at his place. He is a very good. Uh, a vatologist that to step his surgery he does very nicely by endoral approach and we have very good panelists today without wasting time i'll go to uh, the uh, questions to the uh, panelists yeah, may, can i uh, share the screen please uh, these are our panelists so we know that pediatric tympanoplasty there is a lot of controversy today because whether to operate or the standard uh, uh, teaching is that you wait till the child attains the age of 12 years or 14 years, whatever. So these are the uh, lot of myths that are there uh, about the pediatric tympanoplasty. We all know CSYM is very common in rural areas of India in spite of a lot of developments and advancements. Tympanoplasty is often considered as less successful than in adults. That is what is a standard teaching says because the attribution is that because of the high water disc media and URI and eustachian tube dysfunction are the main culprits for this. So now the standard teaching in medical colleges that for us is tympanoplasty for tympanic disease you wait till 12 years of age. Is it because of high recurrence rate or are we uh, uh, following the old guidelines? Are there anything new? There are a lot of articles have come in today to change the, our ideas. So now suppose if you don't operate a child who has a bilateral CSOM, the patient will have persistent ear discharge, which is profuse and deafness, which leads to learning problems. And then if you wait for a long time, the patient is going to develop sequelae like CSOM, uh, sequelae uh, tympanosclerosis. And we all know that the safe CSOM today is not safe all the time. So child may develop some issues, uh, complications. So these are the reasons so to know whether to operate or not an uh, early age group. So now I'll start with the uh, first question to Dr. Monish. Uh, Dr. Monish, is it whether to operate a person, suppose if we get a child in your clinic of yes, seven yes. years or age, eight years, uh, suppose if the child has a persistent perforation, the child has visited many, many times to you with the ear discharge and other things. So now at this point of time, will you think of a surgery or still postpone the surgery till 12 years of age? Yes, sir. So good evening, sir. And uh, you know, I think in today's era with the kind of equipments and instruments which we have and the understanding of middle ear, I don't think this is a controversy at all. It's, it's a matter of our convenience and our understanding that these children, in fact, probably need the surgery much more than an adult patient. Uh, that's simply because one, if we leave such an ear which has a perforation, the sequelae which the child will develop are going to be troublesome in later life. Also, the fact that the development of child, especially if it's a bilateral chronic otitis media with a conductive hearing loss, the sequelae of delayed development may sit in, which are you know something which might be irreversible later on. So the learning dis disabilities or problems during learning will be very difficult. So also, you are so, you, you yes, advise surgery. Definitely. So okay. definitely a surgery. You may have a question on regarding the minimum age for surgery, but yes, overall a pediatric patient does require a tympanoplasty if a persistent perforation is there. Okay. Gosh, you ask the answer is same? <clears throat> same, but sometimes I prefer also uh, to evaluate by, with pediatric endoscope, adenoid is there or not. And if huge adenoid enlargement and allergy rhinitis, I just uh, counsel the party just uh, wait for a few uh, years, up to eight years, basically not 12 years. I prefer also just after uh, seven years, eight years, I do uh, periodic tympanoplasty routinely. But uh, before that, I always counsel about the adenoid is there or not. If adenoid okay. is there, then adenoidectomy and followed by a few uh, months waiting. And uh, if drier, then tympanoplasty. Uh, Dr. Madhuri? Excuse me, uh, I'm, I'm reading the messages. They say that the participants, the audience is not able to join us and uh, the organizers have to look into it. Nobody has joined us. 
they are getting different we getting calls from different audience so there is a problem there okay. hello so shall i answer the question now so yeah, yeah. dr arpan uh, mrs arpana please can you look into it because hello. arpana ma'am i am getting a lot of calls that they are not being able to join and you can see there are only 10 here yes yeah that's true but i think there is a different link also for them okay maybe yeah okay. so no uh, okay well, uh, now to answer whether to operate a persistent perforation of course dr s dr monish has said we definitely go ahead and do a uh, repair work in a child though few factors are there which you know choice of patient is important which depends on many factors like age or any disease with eustachian tube any problem in the nose or throat any allergic conditions any cranio facial abnormalities we all have to keep those things in mind and one by one we exclude few things and then go ahead and do the surgery we uh, definitely do a surgery in a child there okay. is no doubt about it uh, dr yogesh uh, yes sir so we have uh, i think the things have been already cleared by, by our panelists you will operate yes sir in our institute is uh, we have a policy that a child about 5 uh, years of the age if he have the persistent perforation with the air discharge and some sort of the hearing problem we operate the child raghavendras i think he is not there okay so it's a, it's very clear that a child with a tubo tympanic disease requires surgery and the things have changed and the understanding is changed so it's always better to operate that is what is the uh, uh, current thinking so now it's a early stage we can operate but we need to take some precautions so, so the standard teaching was that see many people uh, parents will come to us when we say surgery and majority of the ent surgeons would have told them that the child requires surgery but not now so it might be difficult for us to convince them uh, uh, when many people say that it is not required so that is a main task for us to convince the parents actually we all know that the this is the current thinking is that but majority of the ent surgeons by the time the child comes to us and the pediatricians are also there telling no no you wait till the child becomes uh, 15 years of age so do you agree that uh, how difficult it is to uh, 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 no um, uh, counsel the parents so now uh, i will start with the question with dr ghosh uh, what are the advantages of doing early surgery there is a lot of advantage basically if <clears throat> if not done the surgery then hearing and uh, life will be more uh, problematic hearing okay. difficulty so development of the child is more difficult okay. and also to prevent the complication also require surgery okay. i have seen lot of patients so just uh, like the orthopedician uh, uh, consent or on another ent surgeon uh, okay wait for few years seen the cholesterol also so why unnecessary if uh, say variety okay and uh, why unnecessary if uh, dry air if not uh, content degraded why we don't uh, do surgery no is very safe temporoscopy surgery is very safe so the advantages are many than the disadvantages of operating so we need to weigh the oh, advantages no, 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 against no, 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 no. the disadvantage and the risk of uh, there is not of so uh, dr madhuri are you in the same opinion that uh, early surgery is better yes i am the of the opinion because it is a learning age for the patient unless okay. he gets the 100% hearing he will so suppose if the child has unilateral uh, do you advise or bilateral is there any difference in uh, a big uh, difference. The, lit the literature says that bilateral chronic sm or uh, repeated uh, acute sm means that the station to functioning is not normal this gives an indication so there are uh, you know methods like tympanometry we do for uh, seeing the functioning of the station to but it is not good when there is a perforation so bilateral uh, chronic sm gives an indication that there is a station to problem still i will go ahead and do the surgery but before that i will look into the station to working adenoids no no my question is that when the patient has a unilateral perforation hmm. or another patient has got a bilateral perforation yes. so in this scenario hmm. can the child with the unilateral perforation has another year normal year so the child can pull on for some time no i think I, no we he deserves a uh, normal hearing on that side also okay and okay, okay. i'll go ahead and do it 
मल्टीपल अडवांटेजेस operating the child the patient able to hear well and if, see socially when the child is having a draining a year with a lot of pus the school no there will be lot of social issues are there there is that will leave the child with them more psychological uh, problems and you all you can overcome learning problems and you can reduce the frequent use of antibiotics frequent visits to the hospital and prevent complications all these are advantages so early surgery is better all the panelists are opinion that so now if you delay the surgery till the age becomes 12 years so what can happen to the child with the tuberous impanitis we all know that there are not of much complications if the patient has a tuberous impanitis so apart from complications what are the other uh, things that go wrong to the child dr madhuri if you don't operate if i don't operate if it is a dry central perforation usually quite dry there is not uh, any much mucosal uh, hypertrophy then does uh, few years does not make much difference i mean between 8 to 12 years but definitely the learning part or any if it requires repeated antibiotics that is another problem so 3 uh, 4 years doesn't make much difference if it is unilateral ear perforation dry not giving much problem but if it is a chronic problem then it we should not wait till 12 years okay it could be as early as 7 to 8 years because they say gestation tube functioning becomes settled till the age of 8 so that's why yes. they have it is the ideal uh, thing yeah correct it is the ideal age so delay i don't find there is some reason to delay but if the parents say okay we want to wait till our child grows to 12 years he can take care of him manages then i will rather put him then i look into nose throat clear it and wait till then will not force the patient yeah that's it yes yes but if there is a associated retraction pocket chance of developing cholestatoma other or there is a consistent mucosal hypertrophy wet ear then we shall not wait till then okay that can dr yogesh dr yogesh sir. yes sir i too agree with ma'am sir but i have a different take if yeah. if the child was mine so i could not have uh, postponed my child for all those recreational activities which he he deserves sir okay. because he wants to go to swimming he wants to go to the entertainment thing so if i want to give everything to my child i don't think that i can delay for any other patient child uh, or any other parent child so uh, for me if that if if that uh, child wants to go for recreational activities like he loves swimming uh, he likes to hear some music or he wants uh, um, so i will give him a, a new uh, tympanic membrane rather to delay the surgery sir no but the thing is that the, if the patient the when you operate there are chances of high chances of recurrence because of so many other reasons so then it will be difficult for you to explain the parents so that is the yes, other point you need to keep in mind dr sure. madhuri you want to say something i wanted to say dr yogesh i agree with him but he was talking about from the parent side right. but if parents don't agree to that then i was telling that otherwise there is no other reason to postpone the surgery unless until patient says patient attendant says no we cannot get the surgery done yes that's very important that's yeah the only, that is the only thing we should not be forcing the patient attendant in yes yes what is you want to say something sir I, i just want to say that you know we have to consider the patient profile also here uh -huh. right so as madhuri ma'am mentions if the father is not or the parents are not agreeing for it right now or if the child is you know many time the patients are not from very good socio economic background so the recreational activities may not be really an issue there 
so the patient profile has to be taken into consideration though we all are now in favor of early intervention in yes yes we have to take happens. into light up many issues before we yeah. uh, start taking decision yeah, yeah. that so these are all the things can go wrong if you don't operate a child at early age disease can progress can form a cholesterolatoma frequent hospital visits ascular erosions sensory neural deafness and of course the sequel of csm these are the things uh, that can go wrong so now uh, dr govindra has joined okay uh, then i will come back to dr monish uh, see the results of surgery when you compare with children and adults they differ yeah. or equal or better uh in in realistic terms the results in children will not be as good as adults at least in my experience it's not as good and we all know the reasons involved now the results can be in terms of you know anatomically the graft being taken up with no perforation left as well as in terms of hearing gain which is there if i were to really see it look at my results there would at least be a difference of 10% in either of the things right so the uh -huh. chances of failure the chances of recurrent perforation after a surgery are much More higher children. in children okay. as compared to adults gosh uh, <clears throat> literature uh, says that uh, children's results a percentage less but uh, i i don't agree with also cholesterol surgery in case of child also the fantastic mastoid cavity will be there after few but sometimes the adults is very difficult in case of triple mastoid also i i have seen the good results sometimes deep perforation definitely but result is uh, really very good in case of children also but i don't operate normally before 8 years Okay. Uh, and also, we, uh, if I operate in children, definitely I exclude the adenoid is there or not. It's very okay. fond of uh, adenoid, the endoscopic adenoid. Uh, I check the adenoid, extrusion tube, and if uh, no, I think uh, result same or I think if in case of adult also, if you do the surgery uh, above the seventy years of age and compare the eight years of children, I think the better in uh, eight years of child result. Okay, Madhuri, madam. Yes, I have. You know, uh, age has not been that important. Uh, age is not the factor. More important factors are infection at the time of surgery. Choosing the right patients is the patient fit or not. Whether we have taken care of culture sensitivity, we have taken care of the uh, infection. And if it is a dry, clean case, so there are not uh, much, uh, rather equal results for children. So equal results are equal. Yogesh. I too agree with the ghost sir because uh, I don't um, believe that that makes lot of the difference. Uh, maybe and uh, according to the um, monitor, maybe it may be between the five to ten percent. But uh, I don't think there is a huge much difference in the child about ten to twelve years uh, and above. So results are but uh, see many studies say that the results are actually uh, healing is better in children. and uh, because they are having good cochlear reserve hearing improvement is better in children than in adults but in practice it differs because it uh, depends all on the patient's age and uh, you know the treat, where you operate and what kind of patients you have chosen all that matters so now this is the so now we all know that there are some advan distinct advantages of operating a child so what are the problems of operating on a child what problems from surgeon's point of view so what are the problems monish uh, this madam madri madam just a minute there are problems like if we uh, don't uh, a patient has come to us with a chronic you know som or acute uh, this uh, um, per, uh, perforation in tympanic membrane few very important things we must get into the details whether we will look into the nose for any presence of hypertrophic adenoids eustachian tube functioning whether the patient is suffering from any allergies or not unless until we have not taken care of that that will really give us bad results we may not get a healed uh, uh, tympanic membrane with rightly functioning ear so okay. problems are there are you know eustachian tube functioning adenoids any kind of infection patient zero extraordinary canal patient may not support us their parents may not be agreeing to you know the, again i come back to this patient parent may say that i don't want to get it done my at an early stage this is the problems we have to address to 
till we uh, reach the uh, the uh, stage of surgery yeah uh, yogesh so, so what are the problems when you when you want to operate on a child with a hypotympanic disease in a pediatric age group sir so when, when compared to adults what are the problems that you think that that will come in the way of your surgery and what are the challenges that you face so the main thing is that uh, initially to convincing the parents as madhuri ma'am and all the panelists had already said that the convincing the parent is very 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 important and is very challenging because a lot of the patient uh, or the patient party will say that cannot my child be operated when he gets 15 16 or 17 or when he get adult so my usual answer is to them is that if the child could be operated by adult surgeon why there are the pediatric surgeon available in the market because the child needs to be operated right now yeah one thing is that so no, no, they will thing, ask you they will ask you yeah so what are the chances of my child developing a recurrence yes sir my so what answer, are your success see one patient asked me okay one patient father asked me sir yes, you sir. are telling that your uh, results are uh, 95% is is the literature says that are in your hands see whenever you talk to the patient patient will expect your your experience than the literature yes sir so sir uh, so what we normally do is that one while counseling our patient we have a consent form sir in that consent yeah. form we have clearly mentioned the the european the literature american literature success rate indian literature and the and our success rate okay we clearly mentioned out there and if some puppy and after surgery no, yogesh, yogesh yogesh one thing yes, the consent form comes only when they agree and come to the surgery yes, so sir. how will you counsel the when you see when you once convince the parents for surgery the counseling is like you know signing a form that's all yes sir but the, yes. the beginning of the very beginning is very important yes so sir so it is maybe difficult for us to convince the parents to come to such a stage so yes, sir. when they ask you such a question mm-hmm. so what mm-hmm. are the chances of my child getting again a reperforation so we have to be honest we cannot tell them that uh, the things will be very rosy should not yes, be a rosy sir. picture at the same so time you should not frighten them with the complication because yes, you want to when you are in a private practice we have to pull the patient for surgery because we are surgeons we have to operate so yes, if you are in institute like monish is uh, smiling at us so he is a profession is a professor but we are into private practice we are different Yes, so it so it will be difficult for you to answer some questions of the parents so yes, how sir. do you tell them that uh, the child chances of developing a reperforation is small yes sir what we normally tell that if the if the patient party asks this question sir what normally we tell that we answer from the same consent form sir just like we don't okay. show them okay. a consent form but we okay. uh, we take the this thing from the consent form and we answer them sir yeah. now success rate is this much hello yeah yeah please So I I read this point in your this list operated under GA more bleeding and post operative care. You know there is very interesting thing we have made our anesthetists are our very good dear friends. So we keep discussing with them and we keep telling them what we want when we are operating on a child. So when I discuss with them, they said that yes we take care when it is a child and GA we want to avoid bleeding. So they cannot give um, uh, anti hypertensives or you know strong drugs they say we just give a adequate depth of anesthesia and adequate analgesia that will itself reduce the bleeding and most of the times they usually don't need to give because they the moment we give anti hypertensive patients vagal tone is children vagal tone is so uh, sensitive that suddenly so much bradycardia happens that they cannot you know think of giving so worst come worst in one or few patients if it is bleeding very badly then they give small amount of ntg or this otherwise they say adequate depth of anesthesia and analgesia takes care of the bleeding part so ga part i just wanted to share with you all so uh, it is different in children and adults monish want to add something i, I just you know i was just wondering what all you know the success rates when you were questioning the convincing the parents for the surgery i mean if the panelists could tell you know especially enlighten me regarding their success rates after pediatric tympanoplasty if they could give a approximate percentage of these many patients will not have a perforation or will be a one year you know follow up would be really good can we have a percentage of that yes sir i can uh, we have published some articles sir, regarding that sir but yeah. it is not a one year follow up sir it is four to six months of the follow up uh, follow up 
So, so we have uh, published in the International Journal of uh, Pediatric Otolaryngology, where our success rate in pediatric uh, uh, palisade cartilage tympanoplasty is about 91%, and uh, temporalis fossa is about, uh, roughly about 80, 83%, sir. That's a good, good, good. That's good. Gosh, you want to add something? Yeah. yeah. Basically, all are definitely theoretical. But uh, yeah. my practical, practical experience, <laughs> we are doing uh, nearly day, uh, every day in Prosti. So convincing parents, last point, is a being yeah. a private practice, a pure private practice. You know? Convincing parents for surgery, not difficult. Sometimes. Mm. Because sometimes I face the in adults also, long-term perforation, and they told, they said, last 50 years perforation, why the problem? Uh, sometimes it's discharge, uh, hearing less, no problem. But in case of children, if the parents, your uh, sons or daughter is the problem, and you show after microscopy examination, you saw the perforation properly, and today definitely not convinced. Uh, seven, at, uh, at around seven years, you convinced that they one day definitely you should do within a few months or uh, after one year. Just wait for few and keep the dry year, and after that automatically again the if discharge started, he does not go he or she does not go to the periodician. He comes again to you, and yes, after the two yes. to, after two to three visits, automatically you will he will convince. And uh, definitely, yeah. Get the only thing is, we need to we need to gain the confidence of the parents. Yes, then we one. need to be honest and to them. Number one, if you success. if you give a successful uh, uh, yes. year to one side, automatically second day they will come. Yes. there is and no need to convince them. You, That's you it. definitely tell the definitely success rate is more than ninety percent and a real fact. But yes. at a time, definitely there will be re-perforation. Nowadays, sucking technique. Nowadays, more than ninety-five percent success rate. We all in on all a hand. Yeah. But okay. you definitely should utter. There is a definitely perforation will be there. But you should maintain the checking and follow up required. Sometimes if perforation, then you will do the free surgery again. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. The harm basically. Yes, so yes, that's very important. Yeah. Yes. Doctor Govindraj has joined or no? Yeah, I'm the I'm here. Yeah, Govindraj, I didn't know that you joined. When uh, you, no, you joined uh, just now? No, no, I am I am with you. Okay, so now Govindraj, I will start with you. So what are the preoperative investigations, suppose that you got tympanic disease, apart from routine PT and other things? So do you advise a CT scan in all your patients or no? Frankly speaking, if it's a tubo tympanic disease, ah. till date I have not done a, uh, not got a CT scan for my patients. Okay. If it's a tubo tympanic, definitely no. Are there any indications to do so? Any panelists can answer this question. So indication is uh, we don't do a CT scan for tubular tympanic. That is absolutely clear. But if yeah. it's a slight retraction pocket beyond the yeah. end, it is not clearly demarcated that this is clear tubular tympanic. When it is clear, we don't do CT scan. But if there is a slight even chance of retraction pocket being there, we get it done because just to see whether what is the extent of the disease beyond that. Otherwise, 99.9% .9 time, we don't get CT. But I get a culture sensitivity done. That is. Do you do any X-rays or anything like that to know the uh, tegment plate, a dural plate like that before you do any surgery, no, no, or you don't do that? No, we don't do it because you know it is a tubotympanic. If it is tubotympanic, we don't do it. If there is a doubt, then only I do a culture sensitivity testing in almost all my patients. And if there is any adenoid or some problem there, I get a swab from throat and nasopharynx also, rather nasopharynx. I am very finicky okay. about the infection part because there are different bacteria in acute uh, otitis media associated and different bacteria in chronic otitis media. I know, yes, yeah. I, yeah. I, I take care of the ear and keep it, make it dry for at least one and a half to two months. I am reassured that I'm not going to do less justice. I'm going to give the best results. So that is my part as, you know, culture. Yeah. Do you, uh, your so, we do, sir. so we do, sir. So we do a CAT scan when there is when there is a tubo tympanic type of disease associated with any other complications. Like sometimes it may be the acute mastoiditis. And and uh, another indication is that when there is a persistent discharge in tubo tympanic despite conservative management, then we also okay do okay so, yeah that's a one one indication. If the patient has a persistent, yep. uh, some patients will come with the ear discharge profuse for months together. You give whatever antibiotic, it doesn't come down. So in those scenarios, if you want to know something okay. about master reservoir, it may be a good idea to do it. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Yogesh, do you assess the eustachian tube function in children 
is there any way to assess in children to before you operate so normally so we used to assess actually in uh, adults sir there was a thesis in our institute where we used to assess the function of the stitch into uh, function before doing a surgery and mm -hmm. our result was not clinically or statistically significant so From how do you assess thesis, what are the tests you do so what we used to do that one week before operating the adult we used to uh, put uh, this thing um, the jensen boiled in the air and we used to do an endoscopic after 15 minutes and see whether that comes in the nose or not sir so that was one oh, of the that's a very good yeah yeah okay uh, it may be difficult to do in outpatient department yeah, yeah. but it's very good to uh, sir, very good routinely you are doing the in your practice no sir we used to do in the past sir. it was one of the thesis of our candidate okay, uh, okay. Do, and do you do any extended temperometry extended temperometry no sir no 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 we don't do it ETFT, we do any panelists can answer this yes yes sir Others, please, Monish. Uh, sir, we just have a look at the other ear, and yes, you know, the that's a that very ear. good. Yes, that's a very good answer. See, when you, you have to see the other contralateral ear status, then only we'll know what is the eustachian tube. Uh, Govind Raj, you want to add anything on this? Uh, I agree, Monish. Usually, uh, when you see the other ear, if there is no any any retraction, signs of retraction, then at the age of twelve, we and there is no ordinance and any other things, then we take it as normal institutional function. Okay. Uh, Govindraj, this is this question is direct to you. So, what is the smallest age that you have operated for a tubotipant is number one. So, do you have any cutoff age that I will operate only after this age? Or are, are you flexible? Hello? I think, I think it's operated is your audio is not clear. My operated is uh, for tubotimpani case. Okay. Your audio is not stable. Hello? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's okay. No, it is, it's... Yeah. Uh, the youngest age whom I operated is around 10 to 12, 10 years around. No, that's so not... Usually, uh, usually you, uh, I mean, I don't operate at the very young age. Usually, I prefer to operate after 12 to 15 years. If it is dry here, so my youngest age is around eight to ten years. Eight years, okay, eight, okay. Your cutoff point is eight, eight years. Yeah. Uh, Gosh, eight years, yes. Eight years. Madhuri, was very clear. Madhuri, madam, eight years. Yogesh, five years, sir. Five. Oh, very good. Monish, something similar, sir. Eight years, nine years. That's what. Eight years. Yeah, it's all better to you know. See, my uh, opinion also is that I operate. Only after seven and eight, I don't operate with very yeah. small children, probably because of maybe various reasons that I may not be able to tell you. But I think the seven and eight years will be decent enough. And Yogesh is really a hero that he is, uh, can do five years also. No, sir, we do a lot of the thesis work, sir, because it is our oh. institute, sir. So uh, we do um, include all those uh, things. Yeah, sir. now, uh, Dr. Monish, do so you consider the, any opposite st year status <coughs> in predicting the outcome of surgery? Absolutely, sir. So, if uh, as I think initially also we discussed, if there's a bilateral perforation, that itself indicates that there may be a tissue tube dysfunction. Also, the fact that even if the other ear tympani membrane looks normal, but there is a retraction or there is a glue ear which you know seems to be there, a serious otitis media kind of picture, then it's obvious that the ustachian tube is going to be an issue and therefore the results may not be that good. And that's why initially I actually mentioned that the results in a pediatric age group. So as we all know, don't do below eight years of age. The reason is similar. The results yeah. are not as good as an adult for me. At least Correct. for me, it's not as good any day. Yeah. Gosh? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Basically, if you see, both here is a problem. Definitely, there will be a problem in the station tube. Okay. Basically, you should check the adenoid is there or not. If there yeah. is the adenoid, do adenoidectomy first and wait for a few, two months, three months. After settle down, you should do the surgery. Okay. Madhuri, madam? Yes, absolutely. Uh, opposite ear matters. Sometimes there is secretiotitis media. Sometimes there is a perforation. Yeah, it points towards a station tube dysfunction. But along with that, important one is, as he is told, adenoids are very important because they may keep sending septic foci or make mechanical obstruction. So, yeah. ear, uh, so that becomes equally important. That I think... After uh, uh, no, uh, uh, adenoids are most important thing, the one and the only culprit uh, for the failures of surgery yes. than 
actually allergic rhinitis and other things so now the next question is to dr madhuri madam so what are the poor prognostic factors of surgery when you see a child so what all factors that you consider that this patient is going to have a good result or this patient is going to have a failure so what are the factors that you will keep in your mind poor prognostic factors are one is this patient is dysfunctional second is adenotonsillitis third is severely allergic patient fourth is craniofacial anomalies and fifth is chronically wet ear which keeps on you know hypertrophic mucosa is there granulation or tuberculosis may be there hidden which may I might not have syndromic children syndromic children tympano sclerosis ha huh? syndromic children syndromic craniofacial yeah. anomalies like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so this is the poor poor prognosis bilaterality yeah can yeah. i add sir? yeah please please so as you mentioned bilateral is obviously an issue for me a larger perforation or even a very small perforation in the anterior inferior quadrant which may be actually acting like a natural ventilation tube grommet yeah so, yeah these are the patients who really are a problem then if there is a history of previous surgery even if it was a grommet inserted or a tympanoplasty which was tried and has failed obviously that is a very bad prognostic factor for me i mean the revision here surgery in a pediatric age group are really bad then. so just to add on to what ma'am govind raj hello he's not there okay no problem so now we'll start with yogesh again so now suppose if the patient is coming to you uh, for many many times for surgery and they sometimes they get ready and they'll come for surgery to you and uh, still the patient has got some ear discharge so now do you operate on wet ears or you want to make it dry and operate if you want to operate on dry ears how long you want the ear to be dry before you should take up the patient surgery uh, yes sir normally sir we want our patient ear to be dry at least for 3 weeks uh, if it is possible and okay. if, uh, so one scenario is that the child is uh, it is charging now so we will uh, do some conservative treatment and the child ear will be dry and after 3 weeks we uh, take the child for a surgery the next is child he doesn't get ear dry even after multiple time of the conservative treatment or even whatever we do so so in those case also we take the child for a surgery but we do additional surgery then type one tympanoplasty the preferably it should be dry go in raj yeah actually i don't believe in wet or dry dry ear so okay. usually i it really doesn't matter i just go ahead with uh, whether it is a wet or dry it really doesn't matter the cases so wet the ear results are same results are same almost same it is almost same but you know when it in the in the wet ear you need to have a lot of polypoidal mucosa or the granulation has to be removed do you so think results, that uh, the results are almost same once you remove remove all the no, no, disease no. mucosa no, no. my contention suppose if you are operating on a discharging ear like yes. bleeding is more the take up graft rate is uh, you know it be a problem do you think that the results are same can, no it's it can be controlled those things can be controlled okay anything anybody wants to add on this uh, I, 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 gosh I add, yes uh, basically uh, we have a prefer also so yeah. moist and dry ear uh, the same result but i i personally prefer my practice please do dry at least uh, 15 days or 7 days that okay. gives you better men because the otherwise antibiotic will be more antibodies should be given more so i have faced also if uh, uh, from distance patients come and i am doing ot sometimes bangladesh from another state sometimes uh, i have done ot but after surgery i have given the more antibiotic but definitely graft taken up because the uh, now is the technique is a very good no so a uh, graft taken up but you should give the more antibiotic and antibiotic so monish you want okay. to add something yes. sir as per literature the rates may not vary but personally for me you know a dry ear is definitely better than a wet ear uh, it makes my life easier during surgery and i think the take up rate is also better there is however a hypothesis which states that if it's a wet ear vascularization may be better and therefore the graft rotting may be faster but personally for me a dry ear any day at least for 3 weeks i followed dr yogesh out there you know 3 weeks is what i look at 3 to 4 weeks madam madam absolutely go with monish and rest of the people yeah <laughs> see see if the patient is a discharging ear it's yeah. always you know the, the skin is lacerated it's it's difficult to operate number 1 number 2 if the patient has oto some sort of otomycosis 
it makes your life more miserable when you you know because the patient post operatively again suppose the otomatic debris forms a year the kind of a, a feeling that the child will have is a very difficult so i think it is always better to operate on a dry year than operating on a wet year and then uh, causing the problems we are so now before you take the patient for surgery what kind of a consent you take we already discussed anything anybody wants to add can add on this please what type of consent do you take already uh, uh, yogesh was very clear about that uh, do you have any special consent uh, dr madhuri for this so basically all those things which have already been discussed but we will be very cautious and uh, get the form signed by the parents that we have been told that there yeah. be uh, revision surgery may be required or there yeah. be something this is a very important thing which we shall mention in the consent anybody wants to add anything on this or to sir why do we need to take a revision surgery when we think the results are equal <laughs> <laughs> i mean <laughs> the, 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 the moment you say that the child may require revision surgery <coughs> then the parents will tell you that okay we'll operate at a later stage <laughs> so, see we should I, I not my results are not as good that's why i may take you know consent for revision surgery but then everybody else has You know, almost equal results. Then why do we even discuss revision surgery with the consent for this? Yeah. Sir, one one practical point. I I will add, I want to add, sir. We know there is a literature and there is a book also complication will be there facial paralysis. But nowadays don't utter the facial paralysis will be there after master surgery. You mention the every every patient. Sir, there is a chance of facial paralysis. I don't mention. You mention, sir. So the consent definitely. Uh, sometimes write down litigation will be there. See, the But consent really, should be. explaining okay. the surgery as well as a possible complications but not the remote ones mm -hmm. and this is to safeguard ourselves yes. basically consent number yes. one yes. not yes. to frighten the parents yes. actually that is what is that so so what we have uh, uh, so society of uh, nepal ent society we have developed about 18 consent for different ent surgery sir so oh, we excellent we yeah surgery yeah. where yeah. we explain surgery we mention the possible more common complications rare complications and remote complications also out there sir very oh very good, good. Okay, so okay. so it is very easy for us to explain to the patients yeah so if everybody follows the norm it is very easy if you specially form a may if you tell that if i do a mastectomy there is a likely chance that your face will go other side means nobody will undergo surgery is it okay. uh, you know over uh, you know uh, explaining also may be a problem at once So now, uh, Doctor uh, Govind Raj, yes, sir, is there? I am there. Yeah. So now, uh, uh, suppose if you are operating on a child or an adult child for a tympanoplasty, so do you do post oral or end oral? Reasons don't explain. Just post oral, end oral. I do post oral most of my cases. Uh, Yogesh, sir, uh, if you tell sir, I don't use end oral, sir. Most of the cases I go permeatal. Rare cases I go the post oral, sir. So permeatal means with endoscope. No, sir, with microscope, please, sir. So that means you don't do any mastectomy. Ah, uh, no, no, sir. Ah, uh, in the tympanoplasty, sir. So I mean to say, in the tympanoplasty, most of the cases we do permeatal, and very few cases we go for. Tympanoplasty includes mastectomy also, my dear. So tympan, so master surgery, so we have to go either by endoro or by the postoral. So when you want to do only meningoplasty, that means to say that you will do permeatally. Yes, sir. And when you want to do mastectomy, you will do posteriorly. That's what you want to say. Uh, oh, sir, in a very small canal, and uh, in the posterior overhang cases, also we go through a posterior approach. But most of the cases we go by the uh, permeatal approach. Sir. Madhuri, madam. Posteriorly. You okay, uh, Gosh? <clears throat> More than ninety-nine cases are endoral, except few ah, cases are we... endoral. Uh, so, what, so what are the advantages? I have seen you also operating many times yes. endoral, but uh, what are the advantages of endoral over postural? Do you think in your practice? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, patient doctor said uh, you just uh, <laughs> a microscopic surgery and non-microscopic surgery. They thought that uh, postural approach is non-microscopic. That is the different issue. Yeah. But endoral the time. Because is, see, that's the most important point <laughs> is that this is stitchless <laughs> surgery. You explain <laughs> to the patient because one stitch goes here. nobody can it doesn't change the alter the shape of the pinna yes. that is a very good advantage is a distinct advantage and another the moment you say that you want to cut posteriorly they will not agree okay right 
And number two is the more advantageous we uh, follow day by day, the time set. Enroll in session yeah. uh, already one minute and switching also one minute if one in correct, one state. Correct. But first of all, time is consuming, number one. I number two. That whosoever is you know accustomed to whichever, rather end oral, there is at least one or two sutures visible or the line is visible in post oral, nothing is visible. We no, do uh, particular. Uh, uh, Madam, uh, one point I, I want to add. In endoral, after six months, no scar will be there at all. After seven days, no scar is visible because we are doing subcuticular. So this is how you approximate the margins. And yeah, yeah. Monish, you want to add anything? Sir, adult permeator like Dr. Yogesh, pediatric post oral. Okay. Govind Raj? See... Some people are trained with the endoral approach. They follow that. Some people are trained postural approach. At this point of time, it is difficult to change your ideas and practices. But whatever works in your hands better, I think that is the way that should be. The end result should be uh, better. Yeah. So now the next question is to Dr. Madhuri Madam. What graft material you prefer for uh, meringoplasty? Is it the cartilage do you use? Or you use tragal perichondrium? Or you use a temporal fascia? Most, most, most of the cases is temporalis fascia graft, palisade cartilage, uh, tympanoplasty. In very, very rare cases, there is a confirmed situation that eustachian tube functioning is abnormal or there is a mucosal disease. I have been using uh, because for me there are three liver actions. You know, one is catenary, one is uh, ossicular, and one is hydraulic. Catenary liver action acts on the parabola effect of the tympanic membrane. So if we put a stiff tympanic membrane the flexibility of taking the uh, sound waves to the center umbo becomes, you know, less. For me, it is, you know, compromising on the acoustics of the patient. So unless until this is really necessary, very, very rarely I have used palisade tympanoplasty and temporalis fascia works well. Just one condition, when there is a case of uh, perforation after grommet, people come to me, you know, uh, for revision surgeries and that I do, butterfly, cartilage technique, you know, uh, cut the two edges yeah, 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 yeah. there. Otherwise, it is perfectly fine with me for temporal inspiration. Gosh. Temporal Dr. Gosh. Temporal all time. Temporal is Monish. Usually temporal is rarely cartilage. So, right. but usually Yogesh? Yogesh? So, mine is 100% palisade cartilage, sir. 100%. Always. All, all, so, all. Now, you tell me, what, what is the distinct advantage of using cartilage and why do you use that? So, especially in the child, when there is a chance of recurrent infection, and we have seen a lot of the failures after a, because we have done a lot of comparative study, a lot of the prospective study comparing the cartilage and the, uh, and the fascia in the child. So, what we have found is there is distinct advantage of doing a cartilage tympanoplasty in the child. So, since well, eight well, years, what advantage is that? Uptake rate, sir. Uptake rate is very high, sir. So, you, do you mean to say that the recurrence, if you put the cartilage, is better? Recurrence yes. is not there? Yes, sir. If there is also the if there is if there is recurrences, but chances of getting reperforations is less. Okay. So then, uh, what about the hearing results? So hearing results we have compared, sir. Uh, there are slight changes, but it is not statically significant, sir. There is no okay. statically significant difference between the hearing, sir. Doctor Govind, I always refer temporal fascia gram. Okay. And, right. and I believe in, I mean, you know, reconstruction should be to the near normal anatomy. So okay. tympanic membrane should be, you know, once you use a temporal fascia, it will look like a normal tympanic membrane just over a period of time. Now, I think as so, Dr. Madhuri Madam told right. rightly and Yogesh told rightly that, see, that there are some advantages of cartilage being using a tympanoplasty in some special situations like high risk yes. cases. Or when there is a slight retraction is there, where do you think that the child may develop a retraction? So those cases you can use small slices of cartilage or palisade okay. or whatever it works in your hands better. But I think by and large, most of the times temporal fascia will would give a good results. That's so what is the... I would rather use the cartilage piece to repair a thick lateral wall if I have drilled to uh, clear the uh, area rather than... So now we'll start discussing some uh, practical aspects uh, of the surgical technique that is used in the pediatric age group about uh, meringoplasty or type 1 tympanoplasty, whatever. We all agree that we will operate the, all children under general anesthesia. So now 
uh, uh, Monish, do you have any special uh, uh, technique of in, in, in anesthesia to reduce the bleeding in the paraoperative uh, of this one? Do we, uh, do we have any special preparation uh, or any anesthetic technique that you will follow to reduce the intra bleeding? See, we know that in adults, we give tranexamic acid and then give beta blocker and all those things. So what is yes. your preparation? So for me, especially children, it's just the preparation for the for the upper respiratory infections, which is, you okay. know, it should be good enough. Nothing specially different for anesthesia, just that we ask the anesthetist, we usually you know, keeping the blood pressure a bit low. That's it. So nothing other than that. Gosh? Basically, uh... See, I have seen in no, no, no. I have seen in your. See, I have operated in Gosh Hospital. His anesthetist actually uses a laryngeal mask airway with the tiva. Actually, I have seen the technique. Uh, the, the bleeding was less. Actually, it may not be possible in many centers like that. And as Dr. Madhuri Madam told, you give uh, adequate analgesia and depth of anesthesia. If you maintain, the bleeding will be less. And if you inhalation, uh, uh, this one. Uh, analgesia is the most important thing, I think, to get the dry field. Yogesh, you want to add anything on this? Oh, sir. Uh, it's like uh, whatever we do, sir, we do only after anesthesia, sir. Yeah. So, normally, after infiltrating, sir, so what we do is that uh, we keep the adrenaline soap cotton ball inside the external auditory canal. Yeah. Get, uh, all Yo, those uh, Govindras, so, you want to add anything on this? Uh, no, nothing much, but uh, usually the anesthetist will take care. The main thing what he said is to the depth of anesthesia is probably very important. Yeah. So when it's in the depth of anesthesia, the deeper the plane, they, they don't have much bleeding. Uh, now, the question to you, do you do uh, your tympanoplasty with endoscopic or uh, microscopic approach? No, I've been trained only microscopic. Uh, yes, I okay, you follow I, only microscopic. Okay, only Yogesh. for microscopic. Yes. Yogesh? Uh, sir, no, though we try with the endoscope, sir, but we favor still a microscopic surgery because we are trained. So, Madhuri, madam, middle ear surgery it is always microscope. Endoscope is just for viewing and to know the anatomy. Whereas no. the skull base, we do anatomy. Otherwise, Gosh. <coughs> same with my Madhuri, ma'am. Microscope only. I my ringotomy. I will do uh, endoscopy. Other checking for viewing sometimes in cholesterol surgery. Uh, Dr. Monish, do you do any endoscopic uh, meringoplasty or tympanoplasty like that? Or you do favor microscopic surgery? Monish? I think he's uh, offline. Okay, we will go to the next question. So now once we take the temporal spatial graft or cartilage, whatever, and our field is like this. So now we all know that the first step in meringoplasty or type 1 tympanoplasty is to freshen the margins of the perforation. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, do you have any special technique of freshening the margins or a special instrument that makes basically, your job easy? Or normally, previously, we zonal needle, basically. Uh, okay. Just uh, put the zonal needle one portion and continue. Uh, and, and nowadays, I prefer also mm. the sickle knife. Sickle knife, okay, right. Sickle knife also is a good also. Okay. Uh, now you are using, you know, like sickle knife. This is a needle, uh, curved needle, sharp needle. Yes, yes, yes. So these instruments needs to be replaced very often. So that means to say that you will have to buy these instruments or change the instruments from your set very frequently. Are the micro scissors and then the needles. Yes, yes. <coughs> Dr. Madhuri, madam, do you have any special technique or anything? This is the same. I make small perforations in the margins of the tympanic membrane and then join it with the back. I have kept very small sized uh, this sickle knife and small circular knife. With the back of the uh, sickle knife, I connect all these perforations and then remove, try to remove it in one single ring. Otherwise, <coughs> I'm definitely separating the margin in total circumference. Anything, uh, Yogesh, you want to add anything on this? Yes, sir. When there is a very thin margin, sir, when the uh, this thing, there is very thin thing out there. So what I normally do is that I use a very large size of gel form and keep in the middle layer and on top of that, I'll remove the ring. So that makes my life much more easy, sir. Yeah, okay. You will not damage the middle layer because of by that way. Yes, That's a good technique also. No, Monish, on the surface, then, on the surface uh, pressing also important. I prefer also. Yeah, with, with you take the circular knife and then freshen the under the... Monish is there? I think he's offline. Dr. Monish? 
He is offline. No, 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 no. Online, sometimes offline. He is online, but I think his internet is unstable. So yeah. I can see him. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I would usually be making, as I think Dr. Madhuri and Dr. Yogesh also mentioned, small pinpoint perforations, multiple perforations along the rim. Yes. You know, and just remove the whole rim. It's preferably one entire ring, which... Yeah, that's that's the an easy way of doing things. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, so, once the perforation margins, uh, margins are perforation, so now we have to elevate the tympanometric clamp. So, there are different ways and means of elevating the tympanometric clamp. Some people elevate 360 degrees. Some people elevate uh, only halfway through. So, now uh, I'll start with Monish again. So now, how do you give your canal incisions? What instrument you use, and how you uh, up to what level you give the incisions? It's usually between six to twelve, and that's yeah. what it usually would be. But you know, depending on the interior margin, how much interior margin is visible, it may sometimes be extended much more beyond. So, what right, instrument but... do you use to give the incisions? Do you use a blade like this, or use yeah. a circular knife, or a round knife, or something like that, no, so, or beaver's so... knife? So for the vertical incisions, usually it's a scalpel blade, which like which you are using the 15 number or the 11 number. That's yeah. what it is. And you know, for extended anteriorly, maybe the round knife, which, which then will take place. So. Yeah. Anything others wants to add anything on this or improvise the answer? Yes. Govindras? Hello, Dr. Govind? Yeah, you just got disconnected. Can you repeat the question, please? When you give the canal wall incisions in the canal like this, so, do we use a, uh, a blade or do you use a, a sickle knife? Do you use a round knife or something like that? What instrument? Oh, I you use, use? A, I, I use a plasters knife. You know, at times when the canal is wide, yeah, when canal is wide, I can. Uh, I mean, I just go with a fifteen number or eleven number blade. Yeah, now up to what level you give the canal incisions? In, see, this is the left ear. So, how do you give up to what level? Which o'clock you give? So yeah, do you elevate the tympanic membrane all around or you will... Uh, yeah, except 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock position anteriorly. Okay. Rest of the all of the tympanic membrane along with the fibrous annulus, I'll ele elevate. Okay, right. Okay, that's all. Okay. 360 degree, I'll be elevating the remnant tympanic membrane flap. Okay. Madhuri, you want to add anything, madam? To add one thing. Yes, I've been using scalpel knife all along as you've been giving the incision. Yeah. So, I mean, when it is a left ear, I'll go between 9 and 11 o'clock. Rest of the things I will be elevating. And okay. with the help of a knife, I'll separate the tympano, uh, mestoid and tympano squamous suture line. There yes. is a lot of five yeah. adhesions. Yeah. The yeah. knife is really good for that. And another thing is, while there is a, you can see in your own video, superiorly, there is a lot of soft tissue associated with this. Flap. Yes. So I separate it at the starting time only. So yeah. that our uh, flap doesn't become bulky. Otherwise, yeah, we can actually remove this some of the soft tissue with IV scissors. Yes, yeah. yes. We start only so that yeah. uh, this thing is not bulky and go all along. Only one or two millimeters remains attached. Rest of it I said. Anything you want to add, Yogesh? Yes, uh, yes. Gosh? yes. yes sir. Uh, posterior flap, uh, scalpel blade, anterior circular knife. Basically, I am giving the incision also anteriorly also. Okay. And only only six o'clock and twelve o'clock only intact. Otherwise, full, posteriorly full and anteriorly full. So you elevate the tender implant except a part of except it. Except twelve and six. Yogesh. And the oh, so it is the same, sir. Same size as you are same. doing. Sir. Okay. So now, once you give the canal incisions, so you want to elevate this tympanometal flap. So now, what are the precautions that you take to elevate this delicate skin? I'll start with Dr. Madhuri, madam. You tell me what I are the things. Yes. Yeah. So, what posteriorly, when first I have used the uh, scalpel knife to separate the adhesions, then I shift over to the circular knife. I, the tip of the circular knife should be very hard on bone and at the same time very gentle on the uh, this flap. There should yes. not be any fear yeah. in the flap. So, do you, do you use cotton ball or you use gel foam to do this time, job? Over the time, what I have started doing is I am not using cotton ball directly. I put gel foam first. On that, I put the cotton ball. I never let. Oh, it. that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. So that, in, it absorbs blood also and doesn't go directly touches the important structure inside. The Yogesh, same. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, normally we use the cotton ball and so we do it, sir. Same like. Govindras. 
I, I use the same technique, but one precaution what I would uh, like to men, men point out here is, especially when you are elevating, I'll just keep a watch on uh, the origin of the cauda tympani nerve. Okay. And second okay. thing, I when my juniors and I watch, which I observed is, especially when you elevate along the uh, angle of malleus, on the neck of the malleus, you should be very gentle. Uh, if you unnecessarily apply a lot of pressure and uh, there are chances, you know, you can dislocate the joints. Okay. When you want to your well. Monish? Yes. Sir, I mean, just a few points, especially regarding the pediatric age group, you know, use a very small size of circular knife for this. Yes. Many times, especially in the colleges, right, the government medical colleges with the instruments may not be that sharp. So a round knife should be very sharp, especially yeah. pediatric when you have a very thin flap going in. And yes, I do use cotton ball and I'm happy with it. So no gel foam for me for this purpose. Gosh. Uh, I'm not using gel foam or uh, cotton. I am using your like your uh, circular knife, perforated circular knife. And okay. left handed, uh, my tip sucker will be there all time. Okay. And the uh, right, uh, right sided uh, perforated uh, circular knife. And up to the uh, notch of ribness, 12 o'clock. I yeah. elevate with side knife. After okay. that, uh, with the, uh, sickle knife, I uh, nudding the handle of my ears, basically. Yeah, and this is a very good, uh, side knife. very good point uh, brought about Dr. Ghosh. That's see, you can see this uh, round knife has some perforations. So the advantage of having perforation is that the blood can be sucked through the instrument. That's a, that's a very uh, good point you brought out. So and uh, some uh, sometimes you can use the most of the time we all use cotton ball before because at the end of surgery we are going to wash all these things so that we remove the, uh, this one. And and uh, as Dr. Madhuri Madam told. So you can use gel foam with the cotton ball that will be much safer. So that point is well taken. So okay. this is about the elevation of the uh, tympanometal flap. So next, once you elevate the tympanometal flap. So uh, I'll start with the Yogesh. So is it uh, required to do canal pasty in all the patients or just whenever it is required you do? So my indications are just like when there is a uh, herring is um, uh, when there is airborne gap of more than 40. So normally I like to do a canal plasty. One indication is that. Second thing is that when I don't see anterior margin, my indication for going a canal plasty is there, sir. So, so I what? Have to it. Okay, okay. Govindras, canal plasty in a pediatric can... age group? No, uh, canal plasty is done when I am not able to see the whole of the tympanic annulus. All okay. the resistant degree, I should yeah, be able yeah, to see. Yeah, yeah. If there is any overhang posteriorly, I, I, I will remove it. If there is an anterior bulge, severe bulge, then I remove the anterior bulge. If I am able to see the old tympanometal flap and I may, if I am sure that I easily can place the graft, then I will not go for canal plastic. Yeah. In all the cases. Monish, Dr. Monish. S similar as Dr. Govindraj mentions, I mean, and for me, the airborne gap does not really matter. I mean, canal plastic is not related to the airborne gap. Airborne gap. Madhuri, right. madam. Yes, Modish is right. Canal plastic more to see the quadrant, all the margins of the perforation, and it is a very important part of the surgery. We must do it if we are unable to see the uh, all the margins of the uh, tympanic. So, yeah, Gosh, you want to add anything on canal canal plastic? Canal plastic in pediatric uh, age group is very rare, basically. Sometimes yeah. very very rare cases, anterior too much uh, overhang. Then only required. Otherwise, I think all are uh, capable to doing the tympanic. See, whenever the canal plastic is, most of the times it is the inferior canal wall that is bulged actually than the anterior. So in most of the patients, you take a suitable diamond bar, probably 2 mm uh, diamond bar is an ideal one to do a canal plastic. And we need to take care of the flaps. Your flaps may get torn into pieces if you use a cutting bar. So we need to be very careful about the flap, protect them with the cotton ball or with some kind of a foil and you do canal plastic. And we need to be very careful when you do canal plastic anteriorly, temperamental joint is there. At times we expose the cells. Suppose the patient has a, a too much of cellular mastoid. Sometimes we expose the cells into the external canal. Suppose if a cell is exposed, what do you do, Dr. Madhuri, madam? So uh, I will answer this. And there are three important points while doing a canal plastic. One is the yes. junior bulb may be anteriorly or superiorly located, so we have to be very careful inferiorly while doing a canal plastic there. Yeah. Second is, as you told, tympanic TM joint is very, very thin bone separating, so there we have to be careful 
regarding the opening up of the cells it is very important to cover them if first we should not be opening them if by chance we open them up then take a split thickness cartilage with pericondrium and yes. cover it up there so that it is not connected to the uh, this skin if it is connected it is going to develop cholecystoma at later part of time detection pockets and cholecystoma gosh very important yes sir so, yeah okay uh, anything others want to add then we can go for the next question see uh, this question is to dr govind raj see when you are dealing with a child with a subtotal perforation so now the anteriorly the if you keep the graft that is going to fall into the eustachian tube so how do you uh, suppose uh, how do you uh, support your graft anteriorly how do you place the graft anteriorly so that you will not have a residual perforation there yeah just in front of the at the level of uh, eustachian tube orifice One yeah. or two millimeters just in front of the fibrous annulus, I'll make a incision, a window. You can explain that. Same the, thing is that, yeah. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just elevate the window. Yeah. And and most of the time I keep the. I mean, in all cases I keep the gel foam in the mid layer before I place the graft, so that temporarily right. the graft doesn't get medialized. Okay. And I pull and I'll bring the temporary fascia in that anterior window. Okay. So that the so graft it, is stabilized, so, stuck so, and stabilized anteriorly. So your way of anchoring the graft anteriorly is to make a window anterior and window. support the graft. Yes. Okay. Ma Dr. Madhuri Madam, do you differ with this or you agree? I have a, a bit of difference here. I have yeah. two techniques where I do. One is interlay. Interlay is a very beautiful technique. You can separate the fibrous layer from the underlying mucosal layer. Yes, yes. You can keep the graft on that. Yeah. So we can keep a graft all along the bony uh, margins. Okay. Six, beautiful, uh, this tuck-in technique, anterior tuck-in technique, what you are showing. If I'm yeah. doing early technique, just giving, because there is no support anteriorly, we can pull this, uh, we create a tail in the anterior part of the temporal fascia, place Correct. it medial to the uh, handle of malleus, and uh, pull this tail anterior superiorly, because anterior superiorly, there is the least support there. The Correct. important thing to remember is because the tail is too long in one of the few starting cases what I say, uh, foresaw, this tail starts getting adhering to the surrounding structure. So Correct. the point I pull it out, I just trim it to the level of the um, window we have made in the this flap so that it doesn't go anywhere. And for me, I don't ever, don't ever put any gel form in the middle here because for avoiding the lateral retraction, I am placing it medial to the handle of malleus, and to provide the lateral uh, this medial uh, uh, retraction, I am doing the tuck-in technique. So both ways it is being taken care of. So if our graft is rightly placed for me, gel form is not required. Uh, Monish, sir, it's usually the anterior tucking which you have shown in the video, and I'm happy doing that. Sometimes okay. we also do the circum circumferential incision if. You know, if yes. circumferential yes. flap, if there is a very yes. thin margin all around. Yes. And for me, it's almost all cases have gel foam in the middle here. So okay. different from Ardo Madhuri out there. Gosh. <clears throat> basically, I am doing not only window, basically door technique. Basically, uh, 12 to 6, totally flap. I'm eliminating in all cases, entire flap. And uh, 6 millimeter away from the margin. And above downwards, and the uh, fibrous annulus and bony annulus separating. This okay. is an interlay technique type. And totally graft placed and, and take, take the graft and place the anterior wall after that uh, flap placed. So okay. There is no chance of basically. And Failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then again and again, I tried to keep the air is there or not in middle ear and so bulging of the tempering membrane after graft placement. I'll check the uh, bulging. If not bulging again and again, I am pushing the uh, movement, uh, pushing the graft and uh, also flap. So air will be there and automatically like a uh, balloon will be there. So I don't place the gel form. I follow that technique only. Okay. Um, uh, Yogesh? Uh, so normally, sir, uh, uh, I already mentioned that I do a pellicid uh, cartilage tympanoplasty. So normally I use a piece of the cartilage and hold the anterior rim. I undermine it. Uh, uh, so after undermining it, I place a, a gel form on top of that. I place a cartilage. Then on the undermined is I normally put a temporized fascia and reinforce it. Okay. Uh, 
that's okay then uh, <clears throat> the next question is to dr yogesh see when you are doing a tympanoplasty in a child okay they let it be bilateral or unilateral okay you will do mastectomy also or you will not do open the mastoid antrum so normally if it is a case of a safe type that is uh, ah. so it is uh, so it is a safe type of uh, uh, chronic otitis media like ibotympanic normally i don't open it but if it is a persisting discharging here despite of conservative management so okay. i do cortical mastectomy and i do a tympanoplasty okay you have you have your own indications to open the mastoid antrum but yeah. you will open when it is required yes sir mad dr madhuri there are three four situation where i will definitely open it up one is if it is a mucosal disease and i feel that something is blocking the isthmus area second okay. is So that means to say that you want to check the patents of the aritus, is it? Okay. Anosclerotic plaques. Third, okay. there is some granulation disease. Fourth is yeah. slight erosion in the ossicular chain. So three, four things which make me and there is a glue coming out. Okay. Then yeah. Then I open it up definitely. Gosh, you want to open in all patients or you no, have? No, 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 no. Oh, never basically. If only during surgery, if I see the there is a cholesterol, then. Only I prefer to basically inside out. I don't do nowadays the outside in. No, no, no. no, no. What my question is that in tubot in panic disease like oh, this, no, 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 you will not open the antrum. No, no. Why? Uh, why unnecessary? I will, I will open the antrum. So suppose, I, I suppose if there is a block in the aritus, your results will differ. No. Suppose no, if there is aritus is blocked. No, no, basically I am doing the temporal mastectomy. So I check the check the uh, basically the ossicle. So okay. if I I don't believe the isolated pathology in antrum. Okay. So, so you don't I believe see, that the term that the uh, opening the antrum. Okay, that's your philosophy, uh, Doctor Monish. Sir, pediatric or adult usually no opening of the antrum, not even a check hole kind of a thing. Only if you know, as Doctor <coughs> Monish also mentioned, if there is a suspicion that the isthmus is yeah. bad. Yeah. You know, you, you or are, there is a chronically you discharging. Have your, your own indications to open the antrum. Very rare. Very yeah, rare. but when it is required, you will not hesitate to do that. Yeah, absolutely not. Doctor Govindras, do we have any yeah. indications to open the antrum? No, I, I agree with Monish and uh, Madam. So if it's ah. a dry ear, I will never open the antrum. Dry mucosa, yeah. healthy mucosa, dry ear. Yeah. If the discharging ear, yes, I open. And again, depending on the if the earring loss is more than suspecting yeah. tympanal sclerosis, at that time only I will open the mastoid antrum. Otherwise, I'll, if it's a dry ear. Normal middle ear mucosa and dry since six months. I'll never open the antrum. Yeah. See now, then this question to Dr. Monish. Dr. Monish. Hello. Yes, sir. So when you graft, uh, when you do grafting, so now, see, you take the temporal fascia graft. Do you keep uh, on the malleus or under the malleus? And uh, uh, what size of the graft is preferred? Do you say uh, take a small graft or a big graft? And how exactly you put the graft? The so, the yeah. Always medial to the handle of malleus, right? That uh, goes without question. Yeah, is, for me. Is, is, the, is this technique is okay, or you want to differ with this? Yeah, I think something similar. You you make a slit on the yeah you know, superior aspect of it, and then go medial to the handle of malleus, place yeah. it under that, and maybe wrap it around the malleus. So that's what. So can you just explain uh, what is the distinct advantages of doing this double breasting of the graft? Sir, it it usually prevents any kind of medialization or lateralization. You know, it keeps it very stable. So it yeah. you know it's and keeps it really closely attached to the handle of malleus. So it's something which you know which helps later on also with the hearing results also I suppose. So for so me, this you, works out. Do always. you advise any gel foam to put in the middle ear after the surgery? I, yes, always. So why 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 do you put a gel foam? I always stabilize, you know. It, it, it that's the way I've been trained, and you know, it's it makes me feel better that it's stabilized. You think that that uh, putting a gel foam will take a uh, graft take is better? Yeah, so it stabilizes it, prevents any kind of medialization, especially pediatric age group. You know, whatever said and done, we are always in doubt regarding eustachian tube dysfunctions and the recurrent upper respiratory infections. So any kind of retraction, either Dr. Yogesh puts in a cartilage or a gel foam for me, at least in the initial period, is something which I really look forward to. Yeah, Yogesh, you want to you do you follow the same technique yes, of grafting, sir. or you put on the malleus? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is same the same. Thing? Thing. Yes, sir. Same technique, sir. Gosh. Yeah, same technique, but sometimes it's very difficult. Very difficult uh, to place the graft uh, medial to the malleus. At that, yeah. for that reason only, I yeah. always uh, elevate the up to notch of ribnis 
uh, 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 and handle layers totally. So at that time, I um, I don't mind uh, to place the graft over the handle layer also. Dr. Madhuri, you want Absolutely. to add anything? Absolutely, go with Monish, but for two situations. One is if there is a lot of raw area on the promontory mucosa that will make adhesion develop between the, the and the handle of malleus is too much medialized. Many a times it is too much pulled medially and just touching the promontory. So either I, if the promontory is bare, I will put a elastic sheet. Otherwise, very few situations, if I am in doubt that the handle of malleus is too medial, I may keep it lateral to the very few situations. Yeah, one more question to you, madam. See, as you said rightly, the malleus may not be like this in all the patients. So sometimes what happens is that the malleus is touching the promontory. In that case, you cannot put the graft below the malleus. So now number one question is to you is that, do you cut the tip of the malleus in that scenario okay. or no? I have never cut the tip of malleus unless until it is diseased because by, you know, pulling, rotating, I may be giving some kind of unnecessary hearing loss to the patient by doing the, you know, movement of the ossicular chain. Yeah, no, rather, yeah. I would rather place it, uh, pick it up and place it medial. Or if there is a rawness of the promontory, I would either keep it lateral to the handle of malleus or put a elastic sheet. Govindras, do you cut the tip of the malleus? Yeah, if required? Yeah, at, time, at times when the malleus uh, tip is touching the promontory, I do cut the tip of malleus. What are the disadvantages of cutting the uh, tip of the malleus? It will reduce ossicular uh, liver ratio, no? Yes. There is a fixed ratio between the handle yeah. and long process. Actually, tip of the malleus need not be cut in all the patients. As he said, very Dr. Govindra told very rare. rarely, if it is too much touching and then if you feel that the graft may get lateralized, in that scenario, you may have to sacrifice. Otherwise, it's not required routinely. Anything anybody wants to add about this grafting technique or defer something about this anterior window pulling here? Anybody yeah. wants to add or anything? It's a beautiful video you're showing, Dr. Reddy. Uh, anything you want to add or you want to comment on this uh, different, uh, different sometimes, technique? So sometimes when there is a very uh, for certain handle of the media, sir, and if yeah. you cannot tug this thing, so we can sometimes for the tensor tympani muscles when that uh, we drilled in the posterior canal one, and if we can expose that area, so yeah. cutting tensor tympani also will help sometimes. Huh? Yes, that's a good point to be taken with that. You can cut the tensor tympani, and then see once you put the graft, I just want to make the things clear that if you take too much of a long graft, then it will peep through this uh, through incisions and may become a source of infection. So you have to adjust the flaps like this at the end of your surgery yeah. uh, correctly, then the, the, the incision. That's a very important thing. Issue, yeah, yeah. So this is about the technique that we have discussed. Beautiful. So now this is the cartilage, uh, this one. So now the question is the most important thing is the post-operative care. And how long is the follow-up type? And how long do you follow the patient? Now, before you say that you have got a successful uh, year. Uh, Dr. Monish? Sir, a follow-up minimum of three years, three months, ideally six months. You know, it's something which I would, especially pediatric age group, six months is what I look at. But minimum okay. three months. Okay. Anybody wants to differ in this or add anything on this? Uh, All of we, time. We consider, we put subcuticular sutures. Next day, we take away the bandage and send the patient home. Call him after seven okay. days to remove the I gel. This Verosil piece, we have kept in extra artery canal. Then we call after 21 days to remove the gel form. Sutures have uh, subcuticular and they are absorbable. And I get the audiometry done at three months, six months, one year, two year, five years. So my follow up goes till that. And only uh, the take up of membrane in this patient is not um, uh, the good result for me. I must look into the ma maintenance of the middle ear space and the hearing system, which I keep comparing. We have kept an index associated Mary and post surgery index, and we keep comparing it till you know, whatever time, uh, up to the uh, five years. Okay. It is a very so, nicely kept, we have got the... Uh, uh, Ghosh wants to add anything? Yes, yes. Not add, basically, our center's follow-up technique. Operation, same day, bandage and discharge. Okay. Seven day asking to come after seven days, <clears throat> bandage open, no touch technique of gel form. No way. Okay. 
should not remove any gel form. After that, just uh, any discharge or uh, follow up. And after that, we ask the patient to come after 21 days to within a one month. Okay. At that time, just check the graft. If uh, gel form is there or under microscope, we'll remove that and clear cut, uh, checking the graft is taken up. If uh, there is some discharge, definitely put the drop with steroid drop. And then, uh, if graft taken up, then ask to come up after four months. If not a discharge, slight bit of discharge, again, after 15 days, please come. Otherwise, you know, record not required to come. And again, after uh, come after four months. So we need to have a, a regular follow-up, rather longer follow-up than the adults and the children because of various other reasons. So now this question is actually, uh, Yogesh, how do you explain this failure to parents? Suppose the post-operative parent patient comes with a residual or recurrent perforation. So you, do you are honest in telling that there is a perforation or you will tell them you come after six months, we'll see. No, sir. Normally, we do tell them honestly that you have a perforation, but we tell them uh, it's like if the size of the perforation was subtotal perforation and now it has come to 30%, 20% or only the one quadrant will take. Yeah, that's one good part you can explain. The perforation was larger in the beginning to start with. Now it has become small. Yes, small. So, so, okay, that's okay. one one yeah. thing. So what I have learned from one of my friends is that when they are very annoying patients, yeah. uh, parents or the parents' party coming and complaining about the failure. So what normally he used to tell is that see the god has made the tympanic membrane and that was perforated. I'm not a god. I'm a doctor. Yeah. I yeah. made the tympanic membrane and that me also you can fail. <laughs> so they will tell we'll pay money to God only then. Okay. <laughs> So now you have seen a patient uh, after three months of post-op, the child has a perforation. So now do you advise uh, a revision surgery immediately or you want to wait, Dr. Madhuri? I would definitely like to wait and while try to find out if I have done a perfect surgery, what yeah. went wrong. There must be some other uh, reason because, and I must look into it, I must discuss with the parents that I was expecting a good result. Why it has happened? Let me go back into it. Let me find out. So there can be certain reasons, any infection or nasal congestion or whatever repeat, repeated infections. So I'll sit with the parents, decide it and definitely give a gap in between of at least one or two months and then only take up the case. Yeah, I think that's a good idea actually. Gosh, you want to operate immediately or you want to wait for some time? No, no, sir. Uh, in revision case, definitely we should do it. Wait. Monish? Monish? Usually wait, sir. Explain, counsel them well, as Dr. Madhuri mentioned, look for causes which could have led to this. Only then go ahead. No hurries about revision. Go in, Ras. Yeah, definitely wait. How long? Uh, so far, I should have not waited for any of the patients. So not I, much think, uh, I think uh, it will be a reasonably, reasonably good time to wait is at least, I think, three to four months, I think, is a good idea. If it is to be healed, it will heal. Otherwise, we may intervene at a later point of time. So now, uh, Dr. Monish, when do you call a surgery, a tympanoplast in a child is, it is a successful one. If you see a dry ear, or is it an intact and vibrating drum alone, or it should be a functioning ear? When do you call it as a, a success? Sir, anatomical success, you know, what could be defined something as just an intact graft, you know, without a perforation, without a retraction. But what we are looking at is obviously not that, especially pediatric age group, you know, we were looking for a quite of an exhaustive definition of a tympanoplasty, which, which includes complete psychiatrization and integrity of the graft within the tympanic membrane in the anatomical position without any atelectasis, good middle ear aeration, without any effusions. And at least good auditory gain. We're really looking at an ideal, no airborne gap, but you know, good auditory gain is something we are looking at. Yeah, it should be three. All the three things should be there to call it as a success. Absolutely. Anything anybody wants to add on this? Are they agree? He, yes, I agree. With Bonish, because you know, once it may look intact, and later on, if the middle ear space is not this uh, functioning is not there, aeration is not there, he may develop retraction later on. So we must make sure all the three things what the, uh, the Dr. Monish has said. Yeah, so now we have almost taken one and a half hours uh, for a panel discussion. Actually, it was planned for an hour, but I think because the things were going smoothly and uh, all Good. the panelists were very cooperative, we have pulled on to another half an hour extra. So now, I, before I say conclude, I just want to tell you that 
the results of pediatric uh, tympanoplasty are difficult to you know plot or to say figures or numbers it all different studies we have seen lot of articles varying success rates are there there are difference of opinions are there so it's all difficult to compare because we are operating different age group and the definition of the success differ from uh, author to author and the technique used in the hearing outcome all this depends on the experience of the surgeon it will be difficult for us to tell that uh, uh, you know this is a Uh, successful one is the, this one so that is the difficulty in assessing the success so now uh, if anybody wants to say the final words so before we conclude uh, they are welcome all the panelists then otherwise i'll conclude the session yeah, beautiful <coughs> you have presented okay beautiful so slides uh, and everything okay congratulations to okay to conclude uh, our uh, panel discussion so we all know that the success of tympanoplasty in children depends on various mm. factor not only the surgical technique see whenever we see a failure uh, in a tympanoplasty or any surgery it will be first attributed to the surgeon and to surgical technique that was adopted but in fact there are lot of critical things that we need to analyze before we say that the uh, surgical technique was at fault maybe it may be the septic focus or it may be the patient himself not taking the medications or if they are not taken medications properly during an acute attack of cold so of course the recurrences are more common in children so tympanoplasty in children as it was thought it is not so it is safe and it is effective and the results are equally good and we need to operate on children maybe at the age of 8 years so the results are better the small children may not be ideal candidate so the early surgery is ideal we all our panelists are agreed that it lessens the progression of the disease and then the results are better the only important thing we need to understand is that we need to select the patients properly and then take care of the septic focus and then your results will be better so with this i conclude uh, the panel discussion and i thank the all my panelists for uh, patiently <coughs> they have spared the time of one and of our precious time and i also thank the uh, torrent format for taking up this uh, task and asking me to moderate this session thank you very much all the panelists and the torrent people wants to say anything on uh, uh, final words can do that before uh, you call it uh, for it there are some questions uh, from the audience uh, i had shared a pdf uh, in the chat box So uh, all of you can access and answer whichever is suitable. Chat box, uh, okay. Um, uh, ma'am, we cannot see. We cannot What see. One second, ma'am. I am just sharing again, sir. So actually, a lot of people are unable to access this. Uh, I think so many calls were actually coming to me also. Uh, yeah. How many viewers were there? Sir, uh, we are seeing some nine uh, hundred plus uh, registrations total. Nine hundred and twenty-two, to be precise, sir. Oh, excellent, boss. Good number. Getting this number. See, Gosh is there means so many people will come. He is the famous <laughs> man. <laughs> He is not an ordinary man. Nine twenty-five uh, audiences yeah. had uh, connected, sir. There are some twenty-five questions also. Uh, now you can see this. Uh, you can answer it if you if the people want to stay. We can. We should answer it now only. You no. Know? Oh, where is the yeah chat box is there and it is asking us to download actually it may be difficult to download uh, yes, sir yeah. can i ask you some of the questions which i am yeah yeah, yeah please yes, please can ask the panelists panelists yeah. are there okay uh, sir uh, there is a question from dr abhishek kumar singh from devriya uh, he is asking is ossicular erosion is indication for going uh, mastoidectomy in children i think madhuri you can take this question Yes, yes. If there is a ossicular erosion, that means there is some kind of uh, patency defect there. There is a block there which is causing the erosion in that area. So this is one of the. I always, when I am doing canal plasty, I always, always look for the mobility of ossicular chain and continuity of the ossicular chain because it is not written anywhere that it is clear cut tubo tympanic. We may be getting slight in uh, extension of disease there. Then I will do definitely check the patency in those cases. Uh, another question is from Dr. Siddiqui Chennai, sir. It is yeah. he is asking a uh, single point infiltration to canal if it is enough. Dr. Ram Govindraj, you can take this question. 
So usually infiltration we do at all the four quadrants. Especially we just inject at the bony cartilage junction. It is a point where the nerves and the vessels exit and entry. So single point no. I infiltrate all the four quadrants and even I most of the time I do posterior even the posterior place also I infiltrate. Even though it is general anesthesia case, I infiltrate. So this helps in the I mean, local action of little adrenaline. So the vascular uh, the field will be clear. And the plane, especially when it, to take the graft posteriorly, I infiltrate a lot there so that I can get a clear cleavage, just like septoplasty we do know, hydraulic dissection, similar to that, I can achieve that by infiltrating posteriorly also to harvest the graft. Yogesh, you want to add anything on this? Uh, yes, sir. I do believe that's like four-point infiltration is... Um, no, no, single-point infiltration. No, sir, no. Madhuri? No, four-point... Uh, see, I think uh, he is asking. See, the single point infiltration is meant by when you give the infiltration postorally, with the same needle you advance yes, inferiorly yes. and superiorly. Also, you can do that. That's what he wants to see. If you do this this type of infiltration, what will happen is that you cannot infiltrate anteriorly. So you have to remove the needle and put. So then the patient will be having pain. So I think single point infiltration holds good only for the posterior perforations. Probably that's what is he wants it to. And Monish, you want to add anything on the? Is there? You were talking about general anesthesia. Uh, you know, pediatric age group. It's usually general anesthesia, and we usually use only saline adrenaline and don't use allocan ADR. So yeah, that's what is the practice at our place now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, there is a question from Dr. Rama Subramanian, and it is directed to you. He is from Chennai. He has asked if cleft palate is contraindication for operation. What is that? Cleft, cleft palate. palate. Yeah, obviously, see what has happened is that cleft palate child uh, will have uh, more chances of eustachial tube dysfunction because his tensor tympani muscle is not functioning properly because the attachment of tensor tympani muscle, tensor palate muscle is not uh, uh, functioning well. So they are likely to develop, uh, even if you operate these children, even if they undergo surgery for cleft palate surgery, the results are very, very poor in this kind of uh, patients because of the poor eustachian tube dysfunction. I will have a guarded prognosis to these people. And Monish, I think your answer uh, is okay? Sir, absolutely guarded prognosis and, you know, more going with what Dr. Yogesh is the cartilage tympanoplasty for these patients. Yeah, correct. I yes. would rather, you know, cleft palate to be operated first and then yeah. go for the ear surgery. Yeah, and even after that, you know, the prognosis would not be as good. Tensor palate muscle is not properly inserted because there is yeah. no pulley there. So, it yeah. is likely to develop. Actually, in fact, in my experience, if the patient has a cleft palate, they come to you for a different reason. If you examine those ears, either they will have retracted drum or they have otitis media effusion or they will have cholesterol. Either of the three are most common in patients with cleft palate. Yes. That is what is my observation. Yes. Uh, Any yes. other questions? Yes, sir. There is Dr. Asha Jyoti from Warangal. She is asking, can we advise ear drops after tympanoplasty or meringoplasty after how many days? Gosh. Question. Repeat the question. No, he, she is asking, do you advise ear drops to your patients post-operatively? If so, when you will advise? On what day? Oh, ear drop. Yes, definitely. Uh, I already uh, in the second visit, means 21 days of op operation. If I see slight bit of discharge, GT sometimes, I put the drop. Ear drop routinely, you don't use? No, not routinely, not. Monish, do you use? All patients after 10 days of surgery, sir. Yeah. We, uh, I, I start uh, ear drops after two weeks of surgery and it will continue till I see the patients. See, my protocol is that I'll remove the sutures on 8th or ninth day and I'll start the drops on 14th day and I will see the patients after four weeks of surgery from the day of surgery, remove the gel foam and then stop the drops. If you continue to use the drops for many, many days, these patients will land up in otomycosis. So that is my observation. So I stop drops once the graft heals well. Uh, Madhuri, you want to add anything on this, madam? What we do, we put substitute so we don't need to remove it, remove the bandage after uh, yeah. one day. And after seven days, I call because we place a small piece of uh, merosil in the outer part of the extra artery canal. 
So we remove that and then start putting the ear drops after seven days. For how long you put? Twenty one day I call, remove the gel form after twenty first day, and that's it. If it is okay, then we can stop. Yogesh and uh, the same now. Same. Yes, sir. Yeah. Govindra, same. No, I use the drops after start the drops after three weeks. Okay. And I ask them to use for another three weeks. First three weeks I don't do anything. I just keep the external canal packed. Okay. Any other Is questions, it? please? Yes, sir. Uh, there is question from Dr. Rajat Agarwal uh, Noida. He is asking, we know that interlaced tympanoplasty gives better outcomes in adults. Uh, he is asking, what is the scenario in pediatrics for interlay technique? I Same. think Madhuri will be better to answer this. Yes, it is perfectly fine. Interlay is a very good technique to be done. Just make sure that the station tube function, functioning is normal. Interlay, interlay is one of the uh, most preferred uh, technique for the tympanoplasty. It is not different from adults. And ma'am, uh, there is a question from Dr. Gaurav Singhal uh, from Jaipur. He is asking how much days you give antibiotics after uh, tympanoplasty. After tympanoplasty, at least seven days, I definitely give. And after that, if everything is fine and things are, you know, dried up, only local ear drops and no antibiotics can to anyone. And if I find there is any wet, then I'll again take a culture sensitivity. I'm very finicky about the infections. I don't want infection to be the reason for rejection. So I can repeat the culture sensitivity and take it. And if needed, I can repeat. Otherwise, only for seven days. Systemic antibiotics. Okay. And so no, there I, is. I defer. My, uh, my antibiotic protocol is the minimum 10 days, sometimes 15 days. And nasal drop also 15 days. You give nasal drops also? Yeah, nasal drop also up to 15 days. Nasal drop. No, I have seen people using uh, uh, steroid nasal sprays post-operatively. Some people do use uh, steroid nasal sprays, but I am listening first time this nasal drops after surgery. Oh, nasal drops are routinely. Yeah. Why? Because the institution to potency will be maintained. And oh, oh, okay. Very good and point. Yeah, we are also learning new things. Yeah. But in adult yeah. also, sir? Yes, adult yes, also. In adult also, every, every, every diploma surgery. Monish? Every surgery. Monish is smiling, yeah. <laughs> so we, we don't usually use you know either nasal drops or steroid nasal sprays unless there is a clear-cut history suggestive of an allergic rhinitis or a significant nasal obstruction. Not that. But I do use levocetrazine, you know, which would go ahead for yeah, about yeah. three weeks. We use, uh, we use antihistamine uh, for a yeah. four weeks' time. And, and we advise uh, also and nasal if, they, yeah, if they get a cold... Uh, to stop the antihistamine tablet and to take decongestant all along with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, on the similar line, there is a question from Dr. Rama Subramanian Chennai that what is the role of anti-allergic treatment before tympanoplasty? Yeah, the, the question is already answered by earlier uh, panelists that if the patient has some kind of a, a upper respiratory tract uh, allergies, it is to be controlled before we take the patient for surgery. Otherwise, the Results of surgery are not all that better. So it has to be some allergies that can yeah. be prescribing. Yeah. Better to give also, and tell you also post operative also. Okay. Anything this, other else? This is, just, this is the last question uh, from Dr. Ghansha Mahuja, uh, Mumbai Ullas Nagar. He is asking, is it necessary to do adenotonsillectomy before going for tympanoplasty in children? Gosh is a superman. He can answer this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I, I don't believe you're not conflict uh, always. But if enlarged adenoid, definitely we, are, we will do the adenoid first. Otherwise, there is a chance of failure. Yes. Yeah. Go, Monish, you want to add anything on this? A symptomatic adenoid tonsillectomy. No, 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 no. My question to you is that, see, it's very straightforward. Suppose if the child has uh, some kind of enlarged uh, tonsils and huge adenoids, do you do adenoidectomy alone or tonsils also you do? No, so if so, it's, it's it depends on the kind. Uh, you know, the, the, the tonsillar hypertrophy, how enlarged they are. You know, if it's significantly enlarged, grade three, is somewhat which I look at, only then the tonsillectomy. Otherwise, usually an adenoidectomy is good. I think adenoidectomy is the most important thing if they have yeah. it, mouth breathing or recurrent uh, colds and other things. Yeah, no, one experience, sir. I will say I want to say it's very important. Uh, Sometimes I uh, operated adenoidectomy with hypnostic in one sitting. Oh. Yes. Uh, by, uh, from outside patient and insisted and the failure. I have seen the failure. For that reason, uh, believe me, 
I uh, I I operate adrenaline men wait for at least 15 days to one month. After that, I think we should do operate uh, the fibrosis. Yeah, because there adrenaline is there, they... there is secretion sometimes. Correct. Yes, few days secretion will be there, so there is a chance of reperforation. Correct. See, when you do adenoidectomy, especially with coablation, we yes. need to wash the nasal cavity with saline yes. and other things, and so the child will be sneezing a lot. Yes. So there is the chances yes. of reperforation are more. I think it's a good idea to wait for a four weeks to six weeks before yes. we do tympanoplasty. Yeah. Never be uh, collected. Yeah. It should never be done. Extends to wait. So I think we have concluded. Uh, we have finished even the questions also. And again, I thank all the five panelists for their uh, for valuable time they spent for one and a half, more than one and a half hours on a busy day. And I also thank Torrent people uh, for uh, uh, providing the digital platform and also all the viewers for uh, sparing one and a half hours time with us. And I hope it was informative and it is, uh, I think you have learned something. We are, I think, in fact, I have learned a lot of new things by uh, as a moderator. Thank you very much, all the panelists and the current people. Um, thank you, Dr. J.P. Reddy. Thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. I think the torrent people wants to say a final yeah. word. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. On behalf of Torrent Pharma, I personally uh, thank all the panelists for giving us their valuable time and such an interactive uh, uh, discussion, which has helped a lot of people. And we have seen the participation of 900 plus doctors all across India and few of uh, them from Nepal also had joined us. So uh, this is one of the very good participation uh, that too on a working day that we have seen so far. So thank you so much to all the panelists, especially our moderator, Dr. Jay Prakash, sir, uh, Dr. Govindraj, sir, uh, Dr. Mohanish, sir, uh, Dr. Yogesh uh, Nupane, sir, Dr. Tushar Kanti Ghosh, sir, and also uh, ma'am, uh, Madhuri ma'am, who had uh, given uh, their valuable time as well as uh, they shared their knowledge with all of them. I also thank all the audiences for uh, sparing their time for such an academic initiative. You. Uh, on behalf of Torrent Pharma, uh, I assure you that we will be uh, providing much more uh, scientific initiative so that a uh, lot of uh, physicians across the country can connect and uh, discuss and learn from each other's experience. Uh, thank you all of you on behalf of Torrent Pharma. Once again, I thank all the panelists without whom this program wouldn't have been possible. And uh, uh, this is all that we can say and I declare that uh, we can close the program now. Thank you so much. Sir. Yeah, good night everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Arpana.